Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 17th of November 2021 and in this programme today uh, we will be asking is the Biden administration attempting to divide Jerusalem as the battle for God's eternal city starts to heat up? Uh, the uh, US administration are attempting to reopen the uh, US consulate, not in Ramallah, not in even Arab East Jerusalem but actually in West Jerusalem to deal with Palestinian affairs, which effectively uh, endorses their support for a Palestinian state and East Jerusalem as a future capital of a future state of Palestine. And we'll be asking, what will the consequences be for America and the world? Uh, Reagan, um, it's great to see you again, and it's great to be doing a program with you, particularly on God's beloved city. Um, Jerusalem, because there is no other city in the world that's like Jerusalem. Yeah, I quite agree. I, I'm, I'm sure you remember the very first time that you visited Jerusalem. I remember the first time I visited, um, not least because that's, that's when I met my wife, Rachel, um, but an incredible city, rich with history. I've never been to a place like that and that has so many layers of history uh, on every street. Uh, you can go to some place like Rome, but it still doesn't compare to uh, Jerusalem. It is truly a beautiful city. But um, what we're, we're dealing with here is a, a very long-standing, complicated in some ways, uh, political situation uh, wherein Jerusalem has, if we're honest, been very unstable for ever since the time of, of Christ in, in regard to before. its own, before that, yeah, exactly. So we, we see um, all, all of the way back to the days of the judges uh, and then to the days of the kings, uh, that it was always one of those land grab sort, sort of places where there was disputation, the enemies of God's people would constantly try to come against it. And sometimes, yes, God did allow um, enemies to come in and to pillage and ransack Israel. Um, but Jerusalem was primarily protected. You can think of, uh, if you've been, been to the British Museum, you'll have seen the detailing, the extra biblical record of the Assyrian onslaught against Jerusalem when Hezekiah was uh, said to have been pinned in um, to the city like a bird in a cage. And then suddenly the angel of the Lord breathes and 185,000 Assyrian troops die of, of plague. And the historical record on the Assyrian side, it just, it vanishes. They've hemmed him in like a bird in a cage, and then suddenly the Assyrians are back to Assyria, those who survived. Um, so Jerusalem was protected, but as we know, ultimately due to idolatry and um, falling into uh, a lot of the evils of the nations around, it was eventually um, taken. But that reaped consequences for those who overtook it. It's consistently throughout the prophets we see uh, for anyone who comes against God's people, even though God uses their coming against God's people for uh, the purification of His people, they will reap God's judgment. And so we have to look at this context, this situation now, and, and recognize that the ongoing um, dispute um, over Jerusalem it's nothing new throughout uh, a, a lot of history, um, but the claims of the Palestinian Authority on Jerusalem are null and void. There's uh, no substance uh, to them. We should be troubled by the fact that they're very excited by this uh, latest development um, when any group that um, is willfully set on the destruction 
of Israel um, as, as a nation and on a destruction of the Jews really as, as a whole, as um, an, an ethnic group. Um, w we have to lean back sort of and say, okay, what, what's going wrong here? <laughs> They're excited about this. They think it's a, a good development. And as you quite rightly um, pointed out, well, why is this consulate not being opened up in East it should Jerusalem? Be, it should be opened Ramallah. up in, in Ramallah. But I think we also have to realise that Jerusalem is not just a city. It's yeah. not just a capital of, of Israel. This is the future kingdom in which the Messiah will return to. Mm -hmm. um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the eternal capital. Um, and there's only one people that have ever been identified with Jerusalem, and that's the Jewish people. It, it's, their, it's their spiritual home, it's their spiritual city, it's where the first and the second temple was, it's where uh, King David defeated the Jezebites over 3,000 years ago and set up uh, um, Jerusalem as the capital of, of the Kingdom of Israel. This is where the Ark of the Covenant rested. Uh, this is where Tol uh, Solomon built the fabulous first uh, Jewish temple uh, in, in Jerusalem. And then, of course, we saw that the, uh, the Babylonians destroyed it. And then we go through the second temple period. Uh, and then we see the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Uh, and ever since then, no one's really owned that land. We've had empires come and go, but effectively no one's really controlled it. And, and if we look at modern history, I think we have to go back to the kind of Ottoman period yeah. that uh, the, it was uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, the um, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, invaded Jerusalem in, in 1517. <laughs> 400 years later, Jerusalem is liberated by the British Army mm. when um, General Allenby arrives, I think on the 17th of December, uh, 1917, uh, and liberates Jerusalem. But out of respect for Jerusalem, he doesn't ride on a horse. He gets off his horse and walks through the Jaffa Gate. Um, and then we see then uh, the, the League of Nations gives... Um, the British are the mandate to prepare for the uh, for a future Jewish state. Britain rebels yeah. on that. We have the Second World War. Then after the Second World War, we see an escalation of violence between uh, the Jewish and Arab communities, particularly from the Arab communities, which means that it becomes ungovernable for the British. Mm. So the British then hand over to the United Nations to try and get um, a solution out of this. Uh, they failed because the Arabs reject the November 1947 partition plan, which means then that uh, there's, there's no, no peace between Israel and the Arab neighbors. Um, and then what we see then is that when the mandate expires, Dave, David Baron Guan makes the incredible bold declaration and declares an independent state. Uh, Israel is then attacked by five Arab armies um, and the Jordanians then control East Jerusalem, including the old city uh, and uh, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. That is then divided between Jewish West Jerusalem and Jordanian East Jerusalem. And uh, we know June 67, Six Day War, Israel liberates Jerusalem, uh, Judea and Samaria, the Golan Heights and the Sinai, uh, takes possession of Jerusalem and it's in Israeli hands and uh, really goes up to what we saw back in in December, uh, December the 6th, 19, uh, 2017, when President Trump says that he recognizes Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem and, and says that he will move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Then in May 2018, he does it. The new embassy is launched and then the old consulate, um, which is very, very close to the big grand synagogue in Jerusalem, um, becomes part of the Jerusalem embassy, uh, the American embassy in Jerusalem, and it no longer becomes the consulate. Mm. So that gives a little bit of a background history. But yeah. what we're seeing really is by the Biden administration, particularly uh, Antony Blinken, the uh, Secretary of State, is how they want to undermine what America did under Trump. And that commanded such a powerful an incredible blessing from the Lord to, to have um, the world's greatest superpower, the United States, recognize Israeli sovereignty over, the, over, the, over Jerusalem and then to actually move the embassy and completely change the entire Middle East after that. The Biden administration is not viewing this at all through spiritual eyes. They're not viewing this even through the lens of history and the consequences on uh, nations, empires that seek to carve up 
um, Israel, or in this case, just specifically Jerusalem. So the Democrats particularly are responsible for this. They are seeking to reignite the failed Oslo Accords in reopening the U.S. consulate. And it's, it's not in Ramallah. Again, we, there would be no issue with um, th them having some sort of diplomatic relationship and that, that's necessary on just a political uh, level, if for nothing else. In, in Ramallah, they, they're making a statement here. Uh, it's an obsession really with um, making a political point, almost asserting uh, Palestinian authority over Jerusalem. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about, it's not East Jerusalem even, it's West Jerusalem that they're looking at having this consulate um, based. And so th this comes as a real slap in the face of um, the Israeli government. It comes as a, a slap in the face of um, the freedom of the Jewish people to rightfully control uh, Jerusalem. And, and so uh, the White House in unilaterally imposing the opening of this consulate for Palestinians in Jerusalem, regardless of I Israel's opposition to it, um, yeah, I mean, you, you look at that and you think, first of all, there's a complete lack of diplomacy. There's total disrespect of the Jewish people of Israel as a nation. And logistically, it doesn't work. Yeah, it, it doesn't work. Because the Palestinian be Authority is based in Ramallah. That's the, the, the headquarters of the this PA. Could, the, the, it makes no sense. It could actually lead to violence. And surely you, you would have to think that the Democrats know this. You would have to think that um, this is going to cause uh, upstirring among Palestinians who will become in, in some way um, discontent or will think that um, if they encounter any pushback or any difficulty um, that they now have the right to assert authority over that region. Well, this is also domestic influence, isn't it? Yeah. Because we know that the Democrats oh, yeah. have really embraced the extreme liberal progressive wing of the Democrat Party, and uh, we know they're incredibly hostile towards Israel. So if they then position themselves as they're doing, it looks like they're going to win favour. Just to remind you that we are live, we are interactive tonight. Um, this programme is not the same without you, so please feel free to email or text into the programme. And the big question that we have on tonight's Behind the Headlines is, is the Biden administration attempting to divide Jerusalem? It's enough to know your views and your opinions, um, because this is God's eternal city. We have some emails already. Thank you, guys. Um, this is from Johnny. The Biden presidency is a catastrophe. At every juncture, they seem to be actively working against the interests of the U.S., which I, I quite agree with. Maybe they'll put Kamala Harris in charge of their Middle East policy. With her um, opinion poll rating at less than 28 percent, it's... Uh, 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 not looking good for her, thankfully. <clears throat> good evening, Simon and Reagan. It's a dangerous thing to tamper with Jerusalem. I would urge people to get Eye to Eye, a book by William Koenig. We've had William on the program before. Um, excellent, definitely uh, recommend that. It's called Facing uh, the Consequences of Dividing Israel, um, a must. So Eye to Eye by William Koenig. That's from Catherine. Uh, the government of the USA have no right to tell Israel what to do. Hopefully the Israeli government will tell them so. Uh, God bless Glenda, and uh, unfortunately, Glenda, the Israeli government has routinely told uh, the U.S. government uh, what they feel about this action and similar, uh, both in the present as well as in the past, and the U.S. continues to plow forward with a real degree of hubris um, that it's arrogant, frankly, and it will only lead to destruction and, and damage. Will Biden allow China to take over Taiwan? Will he let Russia take back Poland, Ukraine, e East Germany even? Maybe he will allow Texas and Florida independence. Um, I, yeah, I, let's talk about who consistency knows? here. It's a, it's a rare jewel. It's a rare jewel. No, but I just want to say something about uh, Bill Koenig or William Koenig and his book mm. Eye to Eye. He, he's a fantastic journalist. He's a, he's a brilliant believer. He loves Israel with such a passion. Uh, and he's just recently uh, lost his, his wife. Um, so we really need to kind of keep him in our prayers. He's a very special guy. Um, but let's have a look now at this excellent news report put together by um, Chris Mitchell um, that looks about how the U.S. administration, that is uh, Biden's administration, are looking to divide Jerusalem and support the Palestinian cause. Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Stahe wants the world to know 
he's satisfied so far with what he's hearing from Washington. Our relationship with the new American administration has been going very well based on the promises that were made by the Biden administration. We think that this administration is a real departure from where we were with President Trump. Steyer says those specific promises include restoring funding to UNRWA, maintaining the status quo agreement on the Temple Mount where only Muslims are allowed to pray, opposing Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria, which also referred to as the West Bank. The State Department told CBN News in a statement the U.S. does support the status quo agreement on the Temple Mount, opposes unilateral steps that undercut negotiations like settlement construction in the West Bank, and is currently providing $450 million to the Palestinian Authority, some of which is pledged to UNRWA. Perhaps the biggest public nod from the Biden administration came early this year when Secretary of State Antony Blinken indicated the U.S. would reopen its consulate to the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem. That promise met stiff resistance from Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Foreign Minister Yair Lapid suggested the PA use Ramallah as an alternate location. Prime Minister Steyer made it clear that the Palestinian Authority doesn't want the U.S. consulate here in Ramallah, but only in Jerusalem. Ramallah is not Jerusalem. And Ramallah is not the capital of Palestine. We want this consulate in Jerusalem to be the future American embassy to the state of Palestine. This conversation brings into question a divided Jerusalem, which Palestinians want as part of a so-called two-state solution. Israeli leaders maintain the city is their capital and will remain unified. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Danny Ayalon says reopening the U.S. consulate to the Palestinians would jeopardize relations with Israel and endanger the Jewish state's fragile new government. I think that could really wreak havoc within this uh, uh, government. Uh, there's no way uh, politically that Bennett could agree to that. The opposition, which is still headed by Bibi Netanyahu, would uh, have a heyday, and that could spark a large demonstrations. Ayalon says the consulate dilemma puts the U.S. in an untenable situation, with promises to the PA on the one hand and violating Israeli sovereignty on the other. Oh. Um, more emails, please um, do continue to send your thoughts regarding this. Uh, dear both, thanks for sharing your insight on the situation in Israel. We pray without ceasing. Uh, we have also from Ken, uh, will the Americans never learn? A uh, succession of American presidents have found out to their cost the consequences of attempting to divide uh, Jerusalem. And uh, it has to be said that President Trump was a uh, breath of fresh air when it came to Jerusalem, though um, I, I believe in there were a couple of angles towards the end of his tenure in regard to Israel that questions had to be asked. But that said, in regard to Jerusalem, uh, it was a, a really good move to relocate the embassy. The land is not theirs, the Americans, to divide. It's not even the Israelis to divide. The land is the Almighty God's, and He is jealous for it. He has promised that He alone will defend it and deal very severely with anyone who tries to divide it. And it's God's eternal city, as described in Bill Koenig's excellent book, Eye to Eye, which I learned of through Simon. Um, absolutely. God's blessing upon you both as you tell the truth on this important subject. Graham says, Cherished Simon and Reagan, you do such a good revelatory job on today's headline. Zechariah 12, 3 is just one scripture. Uh, you know, many more keep us informed and active. Thank you for that encouragement, Absolutely. Graham. Yeah, can I just give a response? We, we got um, <coughs> the uh, Israeli Foreign Ministry, the, the, the leadership of the Israeli Foreign Ministry described the expected American opening of the consulate uh, to the Palestinians in Jerusalem as an introduction to divide the city of Jerusalem. They stress that the effect of such a measure, which was backed by US President Joe Biden and uh, Secretary of State um, Antony Blinken, will be to undermine, if not completely reverse, President Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of the State of Israel. Now, this is what uh, the uh, Palestinian Prime Minister, we also saw in that excellent uh, CBN News report, said. Um, his name is uh, Mohammed Sasteya, said a few days ago, quotes by, this is quoted in the Palestinian Media Watch, uh, the message of the new American administration is that Jerusalem is not a united Israeli city. 
and that the American administration does not recognize the annexation of Arab Jerusalem by the Israeli side. We would like the American consulate to lay the foundation for a future American embassy in the, in the Palestinian state. He went on to say that the American measures distances the United States from the view that Jerusalem is one city, a view that was the foundation of the decision by Trump administration to transfer the American embassy from Tel Aviv um, to uh, Jerusalem. Now, what's so concerning about this one is that, that Israel and particularly Jerusalem is a united city um, and it, you can't divide East and West Jerusalem. Yeah. And you ask the Arab residents um, of Jerusalem, do they want to live in Ramallah? Do they want to live under the Palestinian Authority? No, they want to live under Israeli sovereignty because they know that they get better mm. paid, uh, they have more freedom. But once they're under the Palestinian Authority, they're not free anymore. So um, this, is, this is the other great lie that they're, they're actually putting out. And there is no Palestinian connection to Jerusalem. I mean, for example, there has never been a Palestinian state in history. Um, can you tell me what the, uh, he, the former head of the uh, Palestinian, uh, the, the former head of state of a former Palestinian state was or what currency they used or what was their national anthem? There isn't any mm. because there's never been a Palestinian state mm. in history. They they are made they are Arabs made up of Jordanians uh, and uh, Syrians and, uh, and Egyptians. Arafat himself was was a, an Egyptian. Yeah, Simon, it's one of those uh, constructs that is fairly recent um, in history. Uh, this conflict, um, we'll, we'll call it that has been brewing and has been going on primarily as a, a direct act of aggression against the Jews. That's what it's about. It's, it's not even only about the land. It, it's about a Jewish state. It's about uh, uh, Eliyah and Jews returning to Israel from all the nations of the world. As the prophets promise, We've talked about this on the program on, on many occasions, um, you know, viewers, Ezekiel 38, um, 37, 38, and 39 are, are, are packed with it. Throughout the prophets, there's those promises. Even going as far back to the days of Moses in Deuteronomy, there's the promise that the people will be scattered among all the nations because of a time of rebellion and idolatry, but God will bring them back to the land that He has given. When we consider God's covenants, there are some covenants that are conditional, and there are some covenants that are unconditional. The land covenant was an unconditional covenant. It was to the people forever, to their generations forever. And though they may be removed for a period of time, Forever is, it is forever. Now, I've come across this, I know you have as well, Simon. There may be some viewers um, who will think, well, okay, guys, are you making too much of a meal of this? You know, you're, you're, you're talking about uh, Israel in, in this particular way and, and Jerusalem, and I, I've had some people suggest that it doesn't even really matter you know, whether Christ returns to the actual physical Jerusalem, and I'm thinking, well, it okay, does matter. It, it, it absolutely, it seriously absolutely, matters. it seriously matters because we're talking about God's word here. We're talking about the trustworthiness of God's word, uh, and whether or not it's authoritative, whether or not um, it, it, it is uh, effective for His people in regard to His covenant. It's also, also literal. Um, he says yeah. He'll return to the Mount of Olives. Well, like, uh, where is the Mount of Olives? His feet will stand there. Exactly. Yeah. So, so where, where do you want Him to, to go? Salt Lake City? Oh, yeah. the, the New York, branch, London, but, um, Washington. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, where? London. He'll, he has to come in a literal, physical place. So let's stop spiritualizing it. Let's stop acting like it doesn't matter when God's Word is very, very clear. Um, I encourage you maybe to um, look, look up a copy of J.C. Ryle, uh, an old uh, Anglican bishop from the 19th century who, who wrote quite a lot and, and preached quite a lot on the significance of Israel. Before, before the state of Israel, he spoke quite prophetically uh, in line with Scripture of a coming day when God would bring the people back. And he pushed against that, that encroaching idea um, of replacement theology um, that, was, that was already beginning to find some inroads, saying you cannot spiritualize away Israel. 
Israel. You cannot spiritualize away God's people. You cannot spiritualize away Jerusalem. Jesus Christ will really return. He, will, he really will return to Jerusalem in real, actual, physical Israel. And he will reign, as the scripture says. And there's nothing else that we see. Um, so this act of uh, the Democrats and this act of Biden, ultimately, we know is it, it's going to fail. It might succeed for a time, but it will only bring damage and, and, and harm um, uh, upon those who, along with the Democrats and, and the Biden administration, will continue to seek to carve up uh, the land that God's promised. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other reasons why uh, the Biden administration really want to reopen the U.S. consulate in West Jerusalem uh, is because uh, it was there that they uh, helped to establish the institutions of power and uh, security mechanisms of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, it was the CIA who helped build up the uh, Palestinian police force mm -hmm. and um, security forces. Also, they supplied the US administration in Washington with figures about Israeli construction uh, in the biblical heartland of Israel, which is Judea and Samaria, and in the Jewish neighborhoods in Eastern uh, Jerusalem so that they could operate against it. Uh, we also see that the Biden administration is preparing the ground for the move and e has even allowed a budget to operate the consulate. And has begun looking into opening the branch of the consulate in the east of the city. And American sources classified the, uh, clarified the opening of the consulate is an election promise made by Biden uh, he owes to large parts of the Democratic Party. So I think that gives a lot more of a kind of background to the reasons. But... This is actually illegal under international law and un, under Israeli law. So if the Israelis say you can't have this, then they're not going to have it. But that doesn't mean that the Biden administration will not put huge, huge amounts of diplomatic pressure, maybe even economic pressure on Israel to push through uh, reopening the consulate in Jerusalem. But it doesn't make sense because you've already got the uh, the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. I've seen it. It's a fabulous building. Um, and that's where they also deal with the uh, kind of Palestinian issues from there. And if you want to so, if you really want to have U.S. representation to the Palestinian Authority, then build a building in Ramallah where the Palestinian Authority is. It makes no sense to be so disconnected from the Palestinian Authority to open the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. Why would they not want it in Ramallah, Simon? Because it, it goes against the, the Palestinian idea that their ultimate goal is the creation of a Palestinian state uh, and to have East Jerusalem as its uh, future capital of a Palestinian mm -hmm. state. But that's not the end goal. Um, because Arafat made it very clear in the, in the late 1960s and took this idea from the Viet Cong is to take Israel stage by stage. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, the PLO were not winning much support internationally um, for calling for genocide against Israel, destroying the whole of Israel and replacing it with a Palestinian state. It, it, it didn't sell no. internationally. So it was the Viet Cong that actually decided to, to sell the Palestinian Authority, the PLO uh, as it was then, um, the idea, take Israel stage by stage. Mm. Get as much territory out of Israel as you can and then when Israel's weak, launch a full-scale attack uh, and actually destroy uh, the Jewish state and the state of Israel. That's been the ultimate plan. Uh, and they use this, and they use the same campaign tactics as the Viet Cong did in the, uh, against the Americans. They used the universities, they used academia, they used the media, they organized great uh, peace protests all across the United States protesting against the Viet Cong War. And the Americans didn't lose that war. Mm. in Vietnam. They lost it on the campuses in the United States. They lost it on the TV screens. They, they lost it uh, because America was no longer willing to pay that sacrifice for the war effort in Vietnam. And the Viet Cong advised the PLO to do exactly the same. So this is the ultimate goal, is the eradication of the state of Israel. Because uh, they still look at this conflict 70 years on and do not even recognize that Israel has a right to exist. And this is why I, I get really fed up when people say that, why should we 
support Israel because Israel is oppressing the rights of the Palestinians, that Israel's doing nothing for peace, mm. uh, and that Israel is essentially the problem, and that Israel doesn't hold to Christian values. Well, the thing is, Israel's having to deal with an enemy that wants to destroy her. You only have to look at the Palestinian media and uh, its education system and look at the incitement against Israel. They want Israel's destruction. They are supported and backed up by the Iranian regime. They are backed up by the most extreme elements within the Middle East that want Israel's destruction. And when we talk about the plight of Palestinian Christians, who's to blame for their suffering? It's the Palestinian Authority, it's Hamas that are to blame. Uh, and then you put this blame on Israel because it's convenient, mm. because you're not prepared to look into the truth, look into the facts of what's actually going on and realise that Israel um, is in a perpetual state of war because these people don't want peace. Every chance that the, that the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat before that, Namumud Abbas, to have peace with Israel, they've rejected it, rejected it Constant. time and time again. They don't want peace. They don't actually want a Palestinian state. They just want an area of territory that they can use to get international support to destroy the state of Israel. If you wanted peace, you wouldn't be constantly um, attacking Israel through all manner of different means. If you really wanted peace, yeah, you, you wouldn't continue to have in your constitution, nothing's changed. In the constitution, there's still this idea of the eradication of, um, uh, of the Jews from the land. If they really wanted peace, uh, that they wouldn't tie themselves to enemies of Western states. Throughout history, I mean, look at it, um, close ties and dealings with um, people like Idi Amin, and you mentioned the, the Viet Cong, as well. Saddam Hussein Just, and others. Come on. All of these guys uh, who they're happy to have links with, um, the IRA as well, um, very, very supportive. Yeah, the IRA, very, very supportive of um, the Palestinian Authority. So wh what does that say to us? When, when will anyone who asks, I mean, when will we wake up <laughs> is, is what I want to know. Like, uh, I, I was walking the other day, Simon, down um, around uh, Soaz. In, in London, a school of um, Oriental and African studies. And there were posters everywhere, right, about uh, when will Palestine be free? When will Palestine be free? And I, th I think um, I mentioned that to you, and you said when, um, you know, when Hamas and the PLA are. Yeah, no, I mean, they like to refer, you know, the occupation of Gaza, and we know that the only people that are occupying Gaza is Hamas, yeah. and they yeah. are a genocidal terrorist organisation exactly. that oppress their own people. And it's the same with the Palestinian Authority. Mm. They haven't had any elections since 2005, when Mahmoud Abbas was elected in 2005. He's still serving one term, and uh, this is 16 years later. Um, earlier today, I had a, a great privilege of um, interviewing uh, Dr. David Wormser, who was the Middle Eastern foreign policy advisor to Dick Cheney in George W. Bush's administration. And this is his thoughts on Biden's plans to reopen the uh, US consulate in Jerusalem. We're now joined on by headlines uh, by Dr. David Wormser, who was the former Middle Eastern foreign policy advisor to Dick Cheney in the White House. Um, David, it's an absolute pleasure that uh, you can join us today on Behind the Headlines. Oh, it's great to be with you, Simon. It's always fun and it's, I learn a lot too, so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and um, David, as a, as a Jewish American and someone that has been passionate about, about Israel your entire professional career, what does Jerusalem mean to you? Well, Jerusalem means the heart of Western civilization. I mean, th there is, uh, we, we tend to forget it in the modern era, but uh, America was founded as the new Jerusalem and Western civilization was always seen after the Renaissance to be standing on two pillars. The one pillar being Rome, Athens and the other pillar being Jerusalem. Uh, and and uh, it's important that both pillars exist. So to be so glib, as an American, to be so glib about just surrendering Jerusalem and saying it doesn't belong to the West, and it's uh, it's so disturbing because the the essence of the move by the United States to try to open this consulate in Jerusalem—it's not just in Jerusalem; it's in West 
Jerusalem, which is the part of, the, of Jerusalem that Israel has held since 1948. So it's essentially questioning the right of Israel to have any part of Jerusalem as its sovereign capital and undermines that and, and guts the idea of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, which can always be repurposed and repackaged as an embassy to both uh, Israel and the, and the Palestinian areas, which by the way, for a day at the beginning of this administration, it was. Uh, if you remember when Biden was inaugurated, the US embassy changed its uh, website and its uh, moniker to embassy to Israel and the, ter and the occupied territories or some such formulation like that. So there's this constant move by this administration to rip Jerusalem away from Israel and away from the heart of Judeo-Christian civilization as if we have no right really laying claim to that, neither as a Jew nor even as Christian. So it's disturbing on so many levels and we can get into some of those levels uh, in much greater depth if you'd like. Yeah, very much like to do that. But before we do, um, can you describe what it was like to be part of the um, Trump administration? and uh, the declaration that President Trump made that he was going to move the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I think that was in December of 2017. Um, and then by May of 2018, we saw the embassy moved and effectively meant that the Trump administration was recognizing Israeli sovereignty over Israel's eternal city, uh, Jerusalem. Um, can you share with us how monumentous event this yeah, was in was, Israeli was, history relation. It was, it was monumentous because um, it, it reflected a coming to terms with both reality and morality. The morality part was that legally there was no foundation, none whatsoever, not to recognize at least the Western part of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move an embassy accordingly there, which is under international law and international practice, the normal thing to do. So this was a, a bizarre, odd, and intentionally uh, damaging uh, condition to the relationship uh, to the Jewish people and to the Israeli nation uh, ever since its creation. So there was a moral aspect and there was a practical aspect, which is you really, if, if the 48 borders mean so much to people, uh, then you don't start laying claims to parts of Israel within the 48 borders. Either it means something or it doesn't. I personally think the 48 borders are impractical, unworkable. And again, Israel has legal rights beyond them under the mandate, which I think we've discussed in other uh, sessions. Uh, so so I, don't, I don't see the, the, the 48 borders as being sacrosanct in any way. But the Europeans... Union and the United States State Department always have said, oh, 48 borders. Well, here we are trying to rip away West Jerusalem, which has been part of Israel since 1948, and make a consulate that serves people in the West Bank in West Jerusalem. So essentially saying that West Jerusalem uh, is oriented toward the West Bank in our minds. And, 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 not, and Judea and Samaria rather than toward Israel. So essentially it's, it's questioning the very claim to, to West Jerusalem. This is both immoral and impractical. Uh, it, it's, it simply boggles the mind. So when the United States decided to move the embassy to Jerusalem, it, it felt it, was not, it wasn't just a campaign promise that every single presidential campaign has promised in 50, 60 years, ever since 67 or even before, uh, these, these campaign promises were uh, eternal every campaign season. This administration actually decided if we promise that we'll do it and they did it. So that in itself was quite momentous. However, the correction of the moral and practical issue was truly uh, moving, that, that this really was finally a rectification of something that was horribly wrong and really raised serious doubts about the solidity of Western support for Israel all along. So, um, David, can you share with us what is the attention behind uh, President Biden and also the uh, Secretary of uh, State, uh, Antony Blinken's decision to try and pressurize Israel into um, allowing the creation of a US consulate, uh, as you said, 
in, in, in West Jerusalem um, that will serve the purposes of the Palestinians. But isn't there also an embassy that uh, in Jerusalem that took over that function um, back in 2019? Yeah, and that's a very serious legal issue, both in terms of U.S. law and Israeli law and international law. Uh, to set up an embassy in a sovereign territory of another a nation or any diplomatic facility in a foreign nation's ter sovereign territory has to require the agreement of that nation. Uh, moreover, it has to be subordinate to the embassy of that nation. Uh, of the, of the, so, so there is no consulate legally allowed to be established in Jerusalem that functions as an alternate embassy to the Palestinians. It must be part of the uh, Jerusalem embassy structure, which is the embassy to the state of Israel. Now, again, there was a brief period at the beginning of the administration before there was a tremendous outcry that tried to rename that as something larger, that it wasn't Israel, embassy to Israel, it was embassy to the entire Palestinian-Israeli situation, whatever that is, um, uh, legally. So it was already a muddled thing. I think what you're getting at is the Biden administration, President Biden himself, may have had certain proclivities that weren't so anti-Israeli. But what you are seeing is a tremendous animus toward Israel among the lower staff, which really runs and determines the policy. You have Meyer Bittar, who's the NSC uh, coordinator for intelligence, deeply involved in the issue. Uh, you have uh, Eddie, Hedy Amar, you have a number of others. These people were either associated with UNRWA when UNRWA was uh, participating with Hamas in the construction of terrorist launching sites and storage depots of weaponry in schools in Gaza. Uh, and and, and at, during the height of that period, uh, one of these officials was involved with that, uh, with UNRWA. And the others were involved with BDS. So you're dealing with a group of people uh, and overall a larger progressive camp in the United States, which has an animus to both Israel and the Judeo-Christian foundations of America. And that, that is what's playing out here. So Biden is almost not a factor. It's the people underneath him who are setting policy. This has nothing to do with Israeli policy. This is an attempt to tear from Israel out, the Jewish nation out, the soul of what is the Jewish nation. If you remove Jerusalem from Judaism, there is no Judaism to some extent. Uh, and, and, and David, what are the practical but also what are the spiritual implications of actually dividing Jerusalem because essentially if the Biden administration set up the uh, US consulate in in Jerusalem uh, to serve the Palestinians and effectively means that they don't recognize Israeli sovereignty over over Jerusalem um, they recognize that Jerusalem will be part of a future Palestinian state and, and what will that mean for Israel and what will that mean for the West well, it means that there's a certain point where the Israelis have to split with the West. I mean, Israel cannot allow Jerusalem to be uh, uh, rent from its hands. It, it's impossible. It is what was at the center for 2000 years of our continuation as a people was the aspiration for the return to Jerusalem. And in the first exile in Babylon, it's what kept us going every day. It's where the rivers of Babylon, the song comes from. Uh, it, it, is, it is the center of Western civilization. It's one of the two core pillars of Western civilization. And that's a very serious problem here. The reason why Jerusalem is important to the Muslim world is precisely because its possession of it symbolizes the fallen state of Christianity and Judaism. So it's a negative you, negative importance to, uh, to Islam. It signals the lowness of the uh, competing religions. But for the, so, so it almost is the same view of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is the symbol of Jewish resurrection. Without it, it's done. And, and, and again, this consulate is not put in some neighborhood in East Jerusalem. It is in West Jerusalem. That, that which was under Israeli control since 48, which means no part of Jerusalem is cleanly part of Israel. The second thing too, that's very important is in terms of practicality, this is not about some symbolic presence in Jerusalem. The battle over Jerusalem is the holy center of Jerusalem, which is the Temple Mount, the city of David, 
what is the historic core of, of, of Jerusalem. And there has not been any formula that's ever been created that, that solves that problem with the agreement of the Palestinian Authority. You even had a situation in 1999 where the Israelis conceded the surface of the Temple Mount, but retained the rights to what's beneath the surface, namely to protect the archeological heritage underneath the Temple Mount. And that was rejected by the Palestinians. They, they weren't even willing to accept the Temple Mount as part of Palestinian sovereignty. They wanted to erase the Jewish presence underneath it, which tells you what the real essence of the conflict was, is, and remains in the future for the foreseeable future with the Palestinian Authority, let alone with the other factions of the Palestinians and their supporters in, in Ankara and in Tehran. Uh, and, and, and David, do you think that uh, this uh, new Israeli government led by uh, Naftali uh, Bennett will be able to withhold the pressure from the United States um, to open the uh, US consulate in Jerusalem? Or will the Americans make um, concessions that, that, that this government will agree to? Well, I, I think, unfortunately, we're dealing with a very dangerous situation with Iran. And I don't think this administration is all that determined to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon because on one level, it's leverage on the Israelis. That the more that Iran strengthens and becomes uh, and dangers becoming a nuclear power, let alone crosses the threshold, the more the United States then makes the point to Israel, you need us, you need to depend on us. Now you're in real trouble. And, and then they leverage that for quote progress on the, on the Palestinian issue. Uh, so there's leverage there, but again, I think that I, I don't think an Israeli government would survive a genuine concession on the consulate issue in Jerusalem. I may be wrong about that, but but my sense is there there are enough people in this government who couldn't stomach that concession. Uh, but the pressure will be immense; it will grow. There will be interference in Israeli politics. We're already seeing it. Somebody organized a letter of 300 former generals octogenarians to say that, oh, Israel could easily give up on this. It's just, you know, it's just a consulate. So why, why generals have a particular voice on this? I don't see a security angle, uh, a military angle to this question. So I don't see why they have a particular professional reason to weigh in on as a professional community. But nonetheless, they did, and I'm sure that was organized. This is part of a campaign as is the uh, Oslo meetings going on as we speak. Uh, which are an attempt to resurrect the Oslo process. So there's definitely a full court press here in the United States. Uh, this administration is pulling all the plugs uh, and the, the pressure will be immense. Uh, David, I want to thank you so much for joining us for Behind the Headlines and thank you for giving the warning because there is a battle for Jerusalem and we've got to fight that battle that to ensure absolutely. that Jerusalem is never ever divided and it remains under Israeli sovereignty. Thank you for that, Simon and Dr. Vermzer. Uh, we have some emails here. Anita says that she thinks Biden's policies thus far seem to be determined uh, to undo all the good that President Trump did. Anyone pursuing this track is inviting disaster. And uh, um, quotes Revelation 22:20. 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. We have um, also thank you for the discussion. Mohammed Shtaya said it, they want the consulate in West Jerusalem as a marker for the future state of Palestine from the river to the sea. Never will Israel concede to Biden spreading the catastrophe he's making of the U.S. to Israel. Jerusalem is the eternal undivided capital city of the Jewish people. There is no state of Palestine and never will be one. That's from Sharon. Uh, also, we have this um, from a quote from Zechariah 12, verse 3. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, uh, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And a, a very, very strong warning there. Uh, now, we're talking a little bit about some of the measures being considered by the Biden administration. Here's another measure. The second measure that we'll discuss uh, reportedly being considered by the Biden administration is the reopening of the PLO representative office in Washington. A group of congressmen from the progressive branch of the Democratic Party is preparing the ground for this to happen. 
The office was closed during President Trump's term, but the Biden administration is leaning toward reopening it. This will happen when and if legislation being led by Michigan Congressman Andy Levin uh, passes through the House of Representatives. Now, as reported in Israel Hayom by Carolyn Glick, uh, to allow the office to be reopened, Levin wishes to amend the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1987, which is quite significant, uh, Simon. In, in that historic law, the United States designated the PLO as a terrorist organization and prohibited it from opening any offices on its territory or from receiving American funding as long as the organization and its members fail to cease engagement in terrorism. This is a terror organization. It's, been, uh, it, it's not changed its constitution, it's not changed its views. Now, uh, Donald Trump, as we n know, as we discussed before in the program and even this evening, changed this reality, but the Biden administration from the very first days has tried to reverse a lot of what was accomplished in regard to Israel during Trump's administration. In January, almost immediately after the administration uh, changed and, and Biden moved in, the title of ambassador to Israel was changed on the embassy's Twitter page from U.S. ambassador to Israel to U.S. ambassador to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. So we know the agenda that's steering absolutely so i mean essentially the biden administration and the democrats if this is trump's policy then we'll do the complete reverse and this is on everything from climate change to israel to iran to the economy and uh, they're making a right hash of it now what worries me in particular is that uh, for for the palestinians to come to uh into peace negotiations with israel there has to be a cost they have to pay a price in order to enter into negotiations. We've seen that Israel has been forced to freeze settlement buildings, whether that's in Jerusalem or in Judea and Samaria, that Israel would have to give large swathes of land to a future Palestinian state uh, for peace. We've seen that Israel's withdrew from, uh, unilaterally withdraw from Gaza in 2005 uh, for peace, and look where that got Israel and the West. And, and what price is the Biden administration putting on the Palestinian Authority? Um, and concessions they have to make to come to the negotiations to get U.S. support. None is, is, is the actual answer. So quickly, the Palestinians have been frozen out of the, of the peace negotiations with Israel under President Trump because they were not prepared to make concessions uh, for peace and didn't want to end the 70 plus year conflict. Uh, we see that under Biden, the Palestinians have not been asked to stop their incitement or their terrorism and violence against Israel and the Jewish people in the education system, nor have they been told to stop their funding of the Palestinian uh, terrorists in Israeli jails that have blood on their hands. Uh, they have not been um, any demands placed on the Palestinian Authority to reform and end the billions of aid money that has been wasted in corruption. Uh, there's been no demands to stop the awful human rights uh, violations by the Palestinian Authority against their own people uh, when they express their concerns about the authoritarian nature of the, of the uh, Abbas regime. And uh, there's been no calls by the US administration for the Palestinian Authority to have any parliamentary or presidential elections, and the last elections were in 2005. Um, and sadly, if we had an extra 10 minutes, we'd go through and just get you some of the statements from Israel's leaders on what their thoughts are. Now, when it comes to Israel, we can't be on the sidelines. We can't be apathetic. We can't be indifferent because we know that God has a particular plan for Israel and the Jewish people, and the nation is there in fulfillment of biblical prophecy and you can't deny that you can't deny the connection that the jewish people have with the land of israel and with their eternal city jerusalem and at the moment there is a uh, underway a battle for jerusalem um, in which uh, the americans are supporting uh, the uh, palestinian authority and the extremists in the middle east um, because this is part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. If Jerusalem goes, we lose Jerusalem, we've lost the West. This is why it's so critical that we need to continue to pray and stand for Israel and the Jewish people, but also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm. Because after all, 
This is where the Messiah is coming back. He's coming back to rule and reign and he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. And where the Mount of Olives? They're in Jerusalem. So uh, just very quickly, I have a Zoom event that I'm doing tomorrow with uh, ICEJ UK and uh, we're calling that uh, Jerusalem Dispatch Live and that's with uh, Reverend Malcolm Heading, who is the former chief executive of uh, ICEJ, uh, talking about his experiences of living, working in Israel and what are the challenges facing Israel and the church today um, so please uh, get in touch with the office if you want to know more i want to thank you for watching this program um, we can't afford to be indifferent when it comes to israel we need to show the jewish people and israel the love that god has placed in our heart for his land and his people this is why we have to fight and pray for the peace of jerusalem so thank you for watching behind the headlines